Okay, well, here we go, starting our next unit, um, and we're going to go kind of a total opposite, where we just uh, had investigated one of the larger concepts in biology, um, ecology. We're going to zoom back down to a tiny microscopic level and look at one of the basic structural units of function in biology of all living things, the cell. Because uh, if you remember back in the beginning of the class, right on day two or three, one of our major characteristics we said is that all living things must be made up of one, at least one, one or more cells. Um, now you could be a single-celled organism if you're just one cell, uh, something like this weird microscopic we'll see some examples of, or you could be something like a human where we are 50 to 100 perhaps no one really knows, an estimate, trillion cells. Now, if you were to draw out a trillion, be careful here, that is a pretty uh, substantial number. That's one trillion right there, to put that in perspective. That's, that's a lot. It's a thousand billions. It's just mind-boggling. Um, and even amongst humans and single-celled organisms, there's a great amount of diversity as well. So uh, what we want to do is basically an adage of Homer Simpson in an episode of The Simpsons when he walks into a store that's the equivalent of Walmart and he says, oh, I love this place. There's so many things and so many things of each thing. Uh, and that certainly holds true here with cell diversity. So let's go ahead and take a look at some examples. Now what I want to do is show you uh, an array of various examples here um, and just have you observe and see if you can pick out some some characteristics, some things you notice. So we're going to start off with epithelial cells from a uh, from a blue whale. Now uh, we're not talking these little tiny dots here. Each of these uh, oval shaped, somewhat oval blobs here that are stained. One thing that's important is that they're not normally purple. They're stained here with a stain, which we'll look at in some of our next videos, so that we can see them. But this is one cell here. So we can see that they have these shapes. Notice each one of them does have a darkened, uh, larger spot in here. Um, kind of a requirement of most cells, not all of them. Um, but it's interesting, a cell from a, a large animal, an organism that is ginormous, that's 100 feet long, that um, is still made up of cells uh, that we have there. So it, you don't have to be a tiny organism. You could be larger, much larger than a human, in fact. Um, and speaking of humans, if we were to go through here, it are some epithelial cells uh, called columnar because of their shape. Notice these are stained as well, um, so we can see them, but these are um, columnar in shape. Uh, and, but they also, uh, even though their shape is different, notice they do have these boxy, uh, excuse me, uh, round darkened spots in here. So something that's in common. Human's not a whale, but yet they have cells, we have cells. And notice just below that, there are other shapes, still within inside of a human, that are uh, have darkened these darkened spots. We'll see what those are in later videos. In fact, you probably already know what they are, uh, but they're a compressed shape. These are a different form of epithelial shells, cells. So one thing that's very important is that a cell is a cell, but cells do not have to have the same exact shape or size. Um, one very, very important thing that we're going to see over and over and over and over and over again in here is uh, a statement that's very, very important, that uh, triple F, form fits function. Um, and that's going to become really is a huge theme in biology that the shape of an organism or the shape of a tissue or an organ or in this case the shape of a cell um, fits its function. Um, it's going to have a specific shape due to its job and vice versa its job will fit its shape so that's somewhat interesting that we'll see. Uh, moving on a few more we're going to uh, advance to a different kind of organism <clears throat> excuse me, from a, a lily pad, a floating, we all know what lily pads are. If we could cut open the lily pad and take some cells from its insides and zoom in on its cells, um, we can see this is going to look a little bit different. These are not stained. These are, are their natural coloring, but we can see they also, in this particular case, have a boxy structure, but they've got a numerous small green structures in them. Um, that's something we didn't see in human cells. You may or may not know what those are. If you do, feel free to record them on your note sheet. Notice there also are large, clear areas. Doesn't look like there's anything in there. I can tell you that's a little bit misleading. There are, quote unquote, Homer J. Simpson things in there. And uh, a lot of this is actually is water. Cells are made up of mostly, primarily water. Um, and that's the case here with these plants. So this is a plant cell. 
we'll be looking at those. Why do they have that shape? Also notice that their outer edges here of interest is not massively thick, but it's not a thin line like we saw in the human cells. It's more of a boxy. This is a little bit thicker here along these edges. You'll find that in um, many plant cells as well. So different structures in different cells. A cell is a cell, but they'll have different shapes, different sizes, different structures. Uh, this is from another type of uh, aquatic, uh, not a plant, but a type of algae, uh, Spirogyra. We can see that, again, each rectangle is a cell here. We can see green structures, but the name fits here. They're, they're elongated spirals. We can still see round structures. We can see a lot of empty space. But again, the cells will have different shapes and sizes, and they also will sometimes be loose individual cells. Sometimes they form single file chains. Sometimes they form clumps. Again, cells will vary in their size and their function. Uh, let's go back to look at a, a human again, but we'll look at not epithelial cells, which are essentially our equivalent to um, uh, skin cells, um, but we can actually see up here a human nerve cell. Now, this one has been stained also, so we can see it again, but look at this guy. He's very, very different. This darkened looks kind of like a monstrous, uh, some kind of a monster or a Tim Burton movie character. This entire structure here, this whole thing is one cell. So you can see it's very much elongated. And again, that form fits function. Think about what nerves do. Uh, nerves are responsible in terms of their jobs for sending and receiving um, information, receiving signals um, throughout the body. So this guy's actually going to be inputting signals and, and, and information from outside, processing that and sending along signals. So you can see, instead of being a nice little round squat cell, he's got these what look almost like feelers reaching out. Um, that, again, it is a cell. It meets the requirements of a cell. But um, we can see it's, it's form fits function, remember, F cubed form-fitting function there. So even amongst, as we said, in a single organism, we can see diversity among cells. Now we want to look uh, a couple other examples really quickly. This is a single-celled organism. He is, or I shouldn't say he, it is only, uh, excuse me, one single cell here. The entire organism is just here. You can see the whole thing. It's only one cell. We can see that darkened spot again. We can see a lot of small dots in there as well. Um, that's something. There's something right here. But you see, this thing looks like a blob. But wait a minute. This is only one cell. This is only one organism. But yet, it has to eat. How's it going to do that? It can move. How's it going to do that? It doesn't have legs. Uh, it can respond to its environment and um, react to the environment. How's it going to do that? It doesn't have muscles. It doesn't have a stomach. It doesn't have a brain. But yet this organism can meet all the other requirements of life. Um, so sometimes you don't have to be boxy or round. You can be blob-like. And I can tell you that this guy actually can change his shape which is interesting. We'll, we'll look at him later on. We'll be viewing him in a lab later on. Uh, another single-celled organism, a paramecium. We can see uh, elongated again, but he's got a lot of structures inside, darkened spots, small balloon-like structures. And even on the outside, if we look really closely, we can see um, looks almost like this guy is actually covered in, uh, again, yes, he's one cell, but it looks like he's covered in fine little, almost like in little hairs. Those are called cilia. What do you think those might do? This guy lives in an aquatic environment. Um, what might those cilia help him do? Um, and how does this guy get food and respond to his environment? So there's another exception there. And I end with um, an electron microscope image of cells. These are called hyphae. These are individual cells from a mushroom. You can see they are boxy as well. Uh, they have what look like these little holes in them, but again, forming chains. So bottom line, if we looked at that quick image of cell diversity with regards to cells, we, we can see that there are uh, a lot of ways that those cells are similar. On your note sheets, I would suggest jotting down some notes. What did they all have in common? What did all those cells share? Because they came from single-celled organisms, multi-celled organisms, from plants, from animals, from mushrooms, from things that aren't even plants and animals. But yet they all had some similarities. And conversely, they all had differences. 
What are some things that were unique to each one of those cells? We'd want to make sure we take care of that. Um, and, and really, bottom line, you should be able to answer at this point, although we, we lack a lot of the minute factual details. We'll get those in our next couple of videos. But cells differ from organism to organism. How? Uh, and, and eventually, we're going to be responsible for kind of summarizing all this. And what are the major parts of all cells? What do they all have in common? So with that in mind, we've just set our stage for our uh, investigation into cells. And we really want to focus on, there, there is a lot of content here, but like we said, what are the parts of all cells? And how do cells um, move materials? move things like food and waste we're going to end up learning um, in and out of themselves. They're going to have to do that, especially if you're a single-celled organism. Um, how do they obtain and use energy? How do they get their food? These are all things that we're going to um, to look at. How do they, remember we said you have to be able to break down carbs, lipids, and proteins. Where do those molecules come into play? in cells. What do they do? Um, the cell has to be able to break them down, has to be able to build them. We're going to be looking at that as well. So we've got a lot on our plates, but it's going to be an exciting journey. Let's do it.